When I was asked by David Stern, who at that time was the commissioner of the NBA, uh, whether or not I wanted to or could buy the Seattle Supersonics, for a kid from Brooklyn who came from nothing, it was like an unbelievable dream to think that I could buy a professional sports team. Um, and the truth of the matter is that when the price of the team was kind of put in place, uh, it was clear to me that I didn't have enough money to kind of buy the team myself. I would need outside investors. And there was a second group who was also interested in buying the group, buying the team, and we decided that we were going to come together and make them a single offer. So we ended up with actually two groups of people who didn't know each other very well came together to buy the signs. And although I was the largest shareholder in the team, I was not the majority owner. And so there was a board of directors, there were investors, like almost 50 people. I went into the Sonics uh, recognizing at the time that the Seattle Supersonics probably had the worst uh, professional sports lease, not only in basketball, but perhaps in any other sport. And I knew that going in. And I had the personal belief, and at the time, the naivete, that I would be able to convince the city council and the mayor that we were buying the team and that we couldn't possibly make a profit, but we didn't want to lose so much money. Could we renegotiate the lease to make it more equitable? And despite the fact that we tried with the city council and the mayor in so many different meetings, it was obvious that the city, after building a football stadium and a baseball stadium, the political powers at the time were not interested in doing anything to help the owners of the Seattle Supersonics try and renegotiate the lease or do anything to help us. So for five years, we went forward. Uh, the team did well one year, not so well in the other four. And each year, uh, we were not only losing money, but each year we were losing more money than the year before. We weren't selling out uh, because the team did not do all that well. And um, the owners, the other owners, started receiving every year what is called a capital call, which means we're losing money, we've got to make payroll, we've got to pay the players, we've got to pay the rent. And so every year, the owners had to give more money back into the team to keep the team going. Well, since I was the kind of lead person, I started getting a lot of pressure from the, many of the owners saying, uh, we don't want to keep making capital calls. So this wasn't what we signed up for. And so the pressure was building, and we had a number of meetings. Remember, we had two separate groups, even though, even though we were one. So I, I kind of led an organization inside saying, what's the solution here? What should we do? And I said, you know, I'm willing to sell uh, my part of the team, if somebody else wants to buy the team from inside the group, and we'll just leave, and we'll take our money out for what we put it in. Now, nobody inside the ownership group of either side wanted to buy the team, primarily because we were losing so much money. And so the capital calls and the pressure, I said, well, if nobody wants to buy the team from inside the group, let's see if we can find a local buyer. And because the lease was so bad and so punitive that no one in Seattle, despite some of the wealth that exists here, was primarily interested in buying the team. I had an offer from a high-tech CEO from Northern California who flat out blatantly said, I will pay the highest price, but I'm going to move the team to San Jose. And so we rejected that. We said no. Then. Uh, an unknown, high-profile person in Seattle did show up, and he said, I'm interested in buying the team. And we thought we had a deal, and then that person unfortunately backed out. And the emotions of kind of going up that curve, thinking we had a buyer and then losing the buyer, the owners were really kind of in a place where we got to figure out what to do. And so I said, uh, I'm going to go to David Stern and see if we can find somebody to buy the team and keep the team in Seattle. Now, I made a terrible mistake. I was you called it the biggest mistake. Yeah, well, I, made, I made two mistakes. Ah. Well, maybe, maybe more than two. Uh, <laughs> the mistake I made was I was convinced 
that if an out-of-town buyer were to buy the team, that the city of Seattle, the mayor and the city council, would understand that an out-of-town buyer bought the team, and if he doesn't re renegotiate the lease and get the lease deal that he deserves, he's going to take the team and move. And the city of Seattle basically said, no, we don't care if he's an out-of-town buyer or not. We're not renegotiating. And I was convinced, that was a mistake I made, that if an out-of-town buyer was here and showed up, the city would acquiesce and work out a deal. The city said no, and this guy said to me, I'm going to leave. And then I was just crushed that I had made a terrible, terrible mistake. And, and the judgment was wrong. And, you know, what I say in the book and what I said publicly, every time I, I see a kid with a Seattle supersonic jersey, I realize I broke that kid's heart. Uh, this is going to be generational. Uh, I've worked behind the scenes to try and get the NBA to realize Seattle would be a great place for a basketball team. Now that hockey is coming here, I think we're getting closer to the day of that hockey. Uh, but I'm responsible for what took place, and I think the lesson is when you have power and responsibility, like I did with the Sonics, you must demonstrate the strength. And uh, it's a very hard lesson. I have to live with that lesson, and uh, it's a mistake that I made, and I apologize.